that verily a person is on the religion of their friends. So let one of you pay very close attention to who they take as a friend. And by the way, if a person is on the religion of their friends, what then of their spouses? Okay, the idea of influence and someone that you're going to spend a lot of time with. And unfortunately for many people, they marry for reasons outside of these things and they try to fit in the deen, fit in the character and everything else. If what makes you a pleasing person in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deen and khuluq, religion and character, and those are the two most fundamental things you look for in a spouse, that is because ultimately you want someone who is also going to rub off on you in regards to their religion and in regards to their character. So a Khalil is someone who is a very close friend. And the ulama talk about this in multiple ways. They say the best relationship, the best relationship is the one that's initiated fi ta'atillah, is the one that's initiated in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it may be in fact that two people who have absolutely nothing else in common come together on the basis of their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their passion for the deen and that is the means by which not only they enter into Jannah, but by which they are envied by the Prophets on the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that those who love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment have these manabir of nur, these pulpits of light. Everyone admires these pulpits of light. They're in the shade of Allah's throne. Why? Because friendship is precious and it was initiated only upon their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They came together on the basis of that love of Allah, they parted from one another on the basis of that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the best friendship. It is the friendship that we find Musa alayhi salam speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah for Harun alayhi salam. Harun was already his brother, but he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appoint him to share the task with him. Ushtud bihi azri wa ashtrikhu fi amri kay nusabbihaka kathiran I'll strengthen my resolve, we'll strengthen each other's resolve because sometimes when you have a righteous companion, when you have a righteous friend and your own resolve starts to wither, maybe you're not even recognizing it, that person pushes you and pushes you and pushes you. So we'll remember you frequently together. We'll pray to you frequently together. We'll carry this amana, this trust of religion together. Oh Allah, this da'wah together. So that is the most ideal relationship and it's the beauty of the relationship of the Sahaba. What puts an Abu Bakr and an Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with them, in the same room together? What puts Umar and Bilal, may Allah be pleased with them, in the same room together to become the best of friends? What puts these people in the same room together except for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that pursuit of Allah's pleasure? And so the best relationship is the one that's initiated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nourished with the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah. The worst relationship is the one that's initiated in evil, right? And a bad relationship, and this is something that's very important as Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah points out, something that started in evil rarely can be rectified to good. Started a relationship for the wrong reasons, it leads you to the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's rarely going to get better, right? Those are the relationships that you just have to move on from. Then there's something very insightful that he says. Most relationships that we have are either relationships that we didn't really choose. They're relationships of, of convenience or circumstance. So for example, you know, friends, close friends, someone of the same age at some point, went to school with this person, we were here, we were there. Communities came together. So they're relationships that were kind of forced upon us in a way, right? And especially family relationships. Or the second one, relationships on the basis of interest. Okay? Not riba, interest as in, you know, like-mindedness and things of that sort. Now the problem comes where, when your interests change, and you want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if you put too much currency in the friendships that were on the basis of interest, or the basis of whatever it may be, there's some, something that's been developed through these bonds at this point, it's hard to walk away from those friendships or at least to moderate them. You don't find that when the Sahaba became Muslim, they went to all of their old friends and said, I'm not talking to you anymore. Assalamu alaikum, I've got to pursue Jannah now. Right? If anything, there was da'wah calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are relationships that even remained between some of the non-believers that were not hostile 
and some of the Muslims, the believers at the time, that even remained, right? And at some point became relationships that were fruitful because they bore the fruit of Islam and those friendships and those families as well. But you start to try to make a change and you kind of feel shackled because I don't know how to start letting this go. I don't know how to start hanging out a little bit less. I don't know how to break the mold of culture. You know, peer pressure when you are younger, friendship when you're younger, the pressure that comes when you're younger, again, this isn't an age-specific discussion, is more about individual expectations and trends and cliques and the worry of being blamed. When you get older, right, it's also cliques and expectations and it's like, I've got to do parties the way my friends do their parties, we've got to gather the way they gather, we've got to talk the way they talk, those types of things. But it's more of the fear of loneliness and you know, losing out on your friends. You don't go to school anymore and make friends the way that you typically make friends. Here's what happens though. What is consistent throughout is that the influence that your circles have on you is inevitable and not easily detectable. Every single person that you spend an extended amount of time with influences you, whether you like it or not, whether you deny it or not, and in ways that you can't even connect or detect, right? You start talking the same way sometimes. You start, you know, making the same jokes. You start uh, being able to predict what that person's gonna say and what a person can predict what you're going to say to an extent. There is an influence. Your character starts to change. Your standards start to change. The things that you see as objectionable or not objectionable, praiseworthy or not praiseworthy, that all is going to impact you whether you like it or not, whether you're 17 years old or whether you are 70 years old your group will rub off on you. And it's not about whether or not it will rub off on you, it's about the extent to which you let that rub off on you. Okay? And that's why there's a saying, a sahibu sahib. A sahib, a companion, is a sahib, someone who drags you. Imma ila al-jannah wa imma ila nar Either drags you to paradise or drags you to hellfire. Literally, the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be resurrected with the people that you love. The people you hang out with, are those, are those the people you hope to be around on Yom Al-Qiyamah? Are those the people you hope to show up on the Day of Judgment standing with you? That you think will have the best chance of making an argument for you? Or are you going to say, oh God, I hope, I'm going to pretend I don't know this person. Who do you want around you on the Day of Judgment? That's who you should be around in this dunya. Who do you want around you on the Day of Judgment? Now the influence is subtle. And the Prophet ﷺ talks about these subtleties, right? Where the famous example of a person who sells musk, and if you don't purchase, a good friend is like a person who sells musk, even if you don't purchase their product, their inventory, they're gonna rub off on you. And you're gonna smell good. Likewise, you have the opposite of that, an evil friend, a blacksmith, right? Just think about a smoker, right? No offense to the smokers here, but smoking is haram. All right, someone smokes cigarettes and you're around smoking secondhand smokers, the, the smoke gets on you, you start to smell nasty, right? Even if you did not smoke the cigarettes yourself, right? There's something that happens to you in the process of all of this, right? So here's what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us to make all of all of that. And here's where we come to our ulama of how to make things of that. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Uhibbu salihina. I love the righteous, even though I don't really consider myself to be amongst them. Meaning, you know what? When I hang out with the ulama and I hang out with righteous people, I don't feel like I'm at their level. I feel like they're better than me. Not only will I hope that their character will rub off on me, but I hope on the day of judgment, I would have their intercession. And I hate the one who trades in evil. Even if I feel like we have the same inventory. I don't like people that trade in evil even if I feel like we trade in the same inventory. So I love those who trade in good inventory, hoping that they'll rub off on me and they'll remember me on the Day of Judgment and testify for me. And I don't like those who trade in evil because I'm afraid that you know, even though we might have the same inventory, those are not the people that I want to be around on the Day of Judgment. Hence, Imam bin Ata'illah rahimahullah ta'ala talks about this powerful way of approaching friendship. Do you want a friendship that's just halal? People around you that simply don't make you do haram? Alhamdulillah, the best types of, you know, the best types of journeys and people that you can be around, people that won't make you sin. 
You can enjoy what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to enjoy and you're not going to sin. That's a good step. But to befriend people who actually inspire you with their very being. They inspire you with their hal. He said, Rahimahullah ta'ala in his hikam, in his wisdoms, لا تصحب ما لا ينهضك حاله ولا يدلك على الله مقاله don't hang out with people whose hal, whose state does not inspire you. The state should be an inspiring state. There should be something about their character that you can identify, something about their state that you want to rub off on you. If you can't identify it, then it's probably not the great, great, greatest friendship. Especially if you can identify a bad trait, that maybe I backbite more. Maybe I gossip more when I'm around this person. I just, things flow easier. No, someone whose state inspires you. And someone whose words direct you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either they remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by rem remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala themselves and injecting the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your gatherings, or they are not afraid to remind you of Allah when they see you distancing yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, in the name of friendship, will support you by praising you when you're distancing yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll tell you, you do you. They'll tell you, good for you. They'll tell you, you're this, you're that. I love you, this, that. Which is great to say, I love you, right? At all times. But, unsur akhaka, zaliman, madlum. The Prophet said, support your brother when he wrongs and when he is wronged. How do you support him when he's wronging? Stop him. You love that person? You're gonna tell them when they're going far away when they're distancing themselves. Now, of course, if that person themselves is far away, then who are they to tell you that you're going far away? They don't recognize it in themselves. Why would they recognize it in you? So someone whose hal is there, who is at a station that is better than you in this regard, and someone who will tell you when you are departing from your stated claim where you want to be. Not someone who's gonna congratulate you, not someone who's gonna support you in your haram, not someone who's going to tell you, hey, you know what, you know, I, I understand that it's been a rough time. No, someone out of love for you that will have that tough conversation for you. Because they love you more than they love your friendship. That's true love. They love you more than they love your friendship. So they're willing to have those conversations with you, even if that means that it's going to compromise the friendship. My beloved brothers and sisters, a person is on the religion of their friends the best friendship or relationship is initiated in the remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the worst relationship is when it began with evil or that takes you to disobedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so be very careful whom you are doing friendship with in this 21st century if you want to gift yourself something good then gift yourself good friends otherwise your friends will break you your friends will be your worst enemy on the day of judgment always look for making good friends or be the good friend that people are looking for and dear brothers and sisters let go of the evil friendship that you have. It might be hard in the beginning, but in long term, it will benefit you. And make friendship which brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A friend may drag you to either Jannah or Jahannam. So better choose your friend wisely. Don't hang out with people whose actions, whose state doesn't inspire you. And if you are continuously around people with no standards, then your standard is gonna fall. So be very careful about your friendship and about the people that you are hanging around with. Help us build an Islamic studio at www.islamicstudio.org. Link in the description.